Great, welcome back. I'm very pleased to welcome Janen Bao and Katie Strasser uh, and Naseki and Gilbus, who will introduce our next session. Um, it'll be a really great discussion around inside and outside new technologies to augment human capabilities. And Seke. Oh, thank you very much, Camille. So I am excited to present inside and outside new technology to augment human capabilities. Today, we have two amazing speakers. The first, Janan Bao. She has 46 awards, Professor of Chemical Engineering, Professor of Material Science of Engineering, and Professor of Chemistry, all at Stanford. And on the side, she's a successful founder of a Silicon Valley startup. But her true passion lies in creating electronics that are, that are um, stretchable, biodegradable, and healable like human skin. And our other speaker is Katie Strauser. She got a PhD from UC Berkeley in mechanical engineering. Her focus was controlled systems. And at Berkeley, she was able to combine her love for robots and her passion for helping people. And now she's a senior control engineer at Exobionics. And there she's doing groundbreaking work. For those who have lost the ability to walk because of paralysis or other injuries, she is creating exoskeletons to offer, offer them the chance to walk again. So these are our two amazing speakers. I'm gonna cede the floor to them and ask questions later. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up Janan Bao. Thanks, Aziki. Let me share my screen. Great. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my group works on skin-inspired electronics. Uh, we are so used to working with cell phones, we cannot go anywhere without our cell phones. Uh, but the question we ask is, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, are we still going to be using cell phones? Um, our answer is probably not. Uh, we are at the era of smartphone, but if you look back, the first smartphone or the first uh, iPhone was only announced in 2007, uh, only 14 years ago. Um, and at that time, uh, we couldn't imagine um, uh, how widely spread it would be like today. Uh, but we see a transition uh, from smartphone into wearables and implantables. And in our particular case, uh, we think that this is um, uh, going to be how we are going to be connected with surroundings and our family and uh, the environment. Uh, so we use uh, skin as the inspiration to think about what are the needs for future electronics. Uh, we are particularly drawn to uh, not only the sensing functionality of human skin, but also its flexibility, stretchability, biodegradability, and also self-healing property. So our thinking is if we're able to mimic all these functions, in a new generation of electronic material uh, that we may be able to completely change uh, what the electronics are going to be like. These are the type of materials that we have been developing in my group. Uh, these are highly stretchable materials, but they are conductive or they can be semiconductive. They can also be made to be both electronic as well as being able to self-heal. Uh, so this piece of um, uh, elastic material is a conductive material, um, but as we cut it, the chemical bonds are broken. Uh, when we place the two pieces together, the chemical bonds are reformed in real time. And this allows the material to recover its both mechanical and electronic properties. So what are the things we, we think uh, these new materials can enable? Uh, the, the picture on the right is this futuristic um, uh, wearable uh, that uh, we may see uh, sometime down the road that may be the replacement of our smartphone. Uh, so we are building now each different parts that may allow that to happen, including sensors, displays, wireless systems, and the batteries. But going even beyond that, um, we envision 
uh, many new possibilities uh, that can enable human to have um, ability to really understand our health uh, or um, uh, really be able to uh, monitor our health in an unprecedented way. Uh, for example, implantable electrodes that can read how our mind really is thinking. Um, and read chemicals uh, that's generated um, uh, from our brain. Uh, and of course, uh, can, um, uh, these sensors can allow robots to be able to feel an object, but can we put these sensors onto our body so that we can have a new type of uh, sense of uh, feeling or touch that didn't uh, exist before in our human skin. And uh, going down the road, uh, we also see possibilities uh, to uh, use um, uh, chemistry combined with biology uh, to build the new electronic connections even within the brain. Uh, here, this is an art, uh, artist's uh, artist, uh, rendering of the um, uh, uh, of um, uh, building conductive, uh, so the shining lightning uh, path is the conducting pathway. They are being built on selective neurons. Uh, we're able to do the initial parts of this already. Uh, so this is uh, maybe um, uh, something down the road, uh, how we can interface electronics uh, with human brain. Um, so um, the um, uh, really the, um, uh, the the future we see for these uh, skin inspired electronics is enhancement of human power. I put my colleague uh, uh, Bill Burnett uh, uh, picture here because um, uh, we did a study uh, with him. He is in the design school in Stanford. We did a study with him, and the question we posed for him is in particular what what will it take for users to um, accept a new technology like this? And through interviewing different potential users and uh, some uh, studies, uh, Bill helped to uh, come up with um, uh, this picture. And the conclusion is that we really need to think about ways to add additional capability to human, uh, that will be something that's needed for people to be willing to put additional electronics and devices on them or even going for implantables. Um, Bill also helped uh, us to uh, make this uh, small movie. Uh, so this is the future when we have uh, these um, uh, new type of uh, electronics uh, uh, that's integrated with our body. Um, uh, the person wakes up uh, and uh, this is showing uh, in the um, uh, watch that's a part of the skin. And you can also see the heart rate and uh, you can use the button to change to see other information. And the person puts on the mixed reality glass that uh, allows um, uh, him to see um, uh, the information about his electronics and the status of the battery. Uh, and uh, uh, it's um, uh, being connected with the um, uh, rest of the um, uh, environment, uh, even connecting with the furniture, the, the lights and turn on the lights. And it tells him he has an event, also remind him he has an event. He goes outside to call a, instead of taxi, in the future it's going to be helicopters uh, as our default taxi. Um, uh, his wife came out to say goodbye to him. The green light represents that she chose to turn on her mood status. So, so green means that she's in a good mood. Um, and uh, ask him uh, whether he's back for dinner, but he forgot uh, there is uh, something to, uh, to celebrate for the uh, family. Uh, wife was not happy about it, turns red, and uh, he immediately changed uh, um, and said, I'm coming back to celebrate. Uh, so that makes um, uh, her happy. And now he goes to his uh, conference uh, and looking up to the hotel um, uh, beer board and he can see from his glass uh, the schedule and the location and then going to the um, uh, 
uh, stadium to uh, or auditorium to give a talk. Uh, right now, I cannot tell what the audience is thinking, and we're virtually connected. Uh, but in his case, if the audience turn on their uh, mood indication, he sees that yellow is not good, so he changes his story, and people are um, more engaged and coming home, celebrating with family. Everybody is happy. The light is all green. Uh, so that is um, a, a, a small movie that uh, Bill helped to put together to imagine uh, in the future when we have these um, uh, skiing inspired electronics uh, seamlessly integrated with us what the future might be. Uh, so my conclusion here is um, uh, stretchable skiing inspired electronics, sensors, circuits, and batteries they are about to change the relationships uh, uh, for between human with electronics and with each other. And we think it's going to happen. It's a matter of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenna. I love the movie. I love the presentation. Um, my name is Katie Strauser. I'm a principal controls engineer at Exobionics. So I work on the opposite end of the spectrum of a wearable robotics and the, the robots that I work on are on the external and supporting the body. Um, and we call these exoskeletons. So have you ever wanted to climb a mountain that's a little higher than what you're normally used to just to get that view? Or maybe you wanted to lift a little more weight at the gym or even just carry your bags of groceries up the stairs in one trip instead of two? Or maybe you wanted to beat Usain Bolt in a race or just catch the bus before it pulls away from the bus stop. It's a lot of reasons why humans want to be stronger, faster, have more stamina, be more efficient. Um, but there's limitations to the human body and the human body is also subject to injury and has to repair itself. And while we are very good at repairing the body, there are limitations to what we can do. So, in these cases, we can turn to robotics and specifically exoskeletons. Can we become Iron Man? When the body doesn't have enough strength, power, or stamina, are exoskeletons the answer? I think they are. I'm going to share with you some reasons and spaces where we use exoskeletons today. So first of all, just to describe what an exoskeleton is, uh, for the biologists in the room, I'm not talking about lobsters and insects today, although that is where we get the idea. So exoskeletons are robots that are coupled to the body and fit fairly anthropomorphically to the body and allow us to impart additional sensing, additional power, or additional support to the body. So we use exoskeletons in a number of applications. Um, I'm going to talk about three main fields today. The first is industrial. So oftentimes in a factory setting, workers are asked to do overhead work. So you're at home, your video is not on, everyone lift your arms up and do that for a while and imagine that you're holding a tool. That gets old very quickly. Your shoulders start to hurt, your back maybe, your chest muscles, your biceps, everything is going to start to hurt after a very quick amount of time. So can we provide support and power to workers who are having to do this repetitive or um, time consuming task to allow them to work with less pain and more efficiency? At EXO, we've developed an, um, the EXO vest on the right and our new generation, the EXO Evo, that does just this. It fits on the user and imparts some extra support and power to the shoulders and the arms where the user needs it it allows them to work more efficiently. The next area we work in is in medical applications. So this gentleman here has suffered an acquired brain injury, whether it's from a stroke or a traumatic injury or something like that, and is going through physical therapy. In traditional medicine and traditional physical therapy, he might practice walking with a lot of support from either overhead harness or multiple physical therapists helping move his body through a gate. These are very expensive, time consuming, and maybe not as efficient as they could be. Exoskeletons like the XONR that is shown here 
allows the user to basically wear a supportive set of legs that help where the user needs help, provide support where it needs support, provide feedback through sensing, and then allow them to learn and how to walk more efficiently and better. And eventually, hopefully, they'll be able to walk out of the device. So in the medical space, we are looking at ways that we can help make physical therapy and rehabilitation more efficient, or to allow patients who maybe have reached the end of their physical therapy to continue natural motion and moving in a way that is healthy for the body. The last space that we look at is in military applications. Our soldiers are constantly being asked to carry loads over very rough and long terrain, and they come back with shoulder injuries and back injuries and are otherwise harmed based on what they're being asked to do. And in order to protect them, we can utilize exoskeletons. So this is the Hulk, the human universal load carrier, which was um, initially developed out of Berkeley. And the Hulk helps allow the soldier to carry this additional weight by transmitting the load to the ground, as well as imparting power and the extension direction of the leg. And then the soldier can hike farther and more efficiently and avoid injury. So these three fields are very different. We have industry, medical, and military. And they're very different, but there are some commonalities. So what makes this exoskeleton a successful thing is that there are positive trade-offs for wearing it. And I promise I didn't cheat off Professor Bao's slides earlier, but she also made this point that when we ask a person to wear an additional device or to put on these exoskeletons, we have to have a positive trade-off for that. So in the case of the Hulk, we are adding extra weight. We're adding an additional machine, but we are able to save their shoulders to make them more efficient and to add that power back into the system so that they can move um, efficiently. If we don't have proper trade-offs, then our soldiers won't want to use the device and it's gonna sit on a shelf and that's, that makes not a successful device. The next thing it has to do is work with the user. So here on the um, left, I show this exo vest and you can see that the shoulder mechanism is fairly complex. Our shoulders have a wide range of motion and this person is being asked to utilize a lot of that range. If the exo vest or the Evo inhibits that motion in any way, the user won't be able to complete their job while wearing the device. And so it has to fit. We do most of this through our mechanical design as well as soft goods and how the device couples um, with the user. And we also do some of this through software. The last thing we need to do is provide help when help is needed. So if the device is helping, say in physical therapy and it's taking over and just walking the steps for the person, they may not be able to really engage their muscles and learn and gain strength like you would want to in physical therapy. So it's really important that the device is tuned for the specific task at hand and provides that help where you need it. And to that end, there's a lot of work for us to do in this field. And I think this goes directly back to what Professor Bao is talking about with, with potential sensing directly to the user. So what is the future of exoskeletons. I think the future is both inside and outside of us. There's work now being done on brain machine interfacing and direct muscle activation sensing. And this two, these two fields are going directly back to working with the person and working when they need help and being able to couple that assistance and that motion very tightly. There's also a ton of work in computer vision. If we can take information about our terrain and about our surroundings, then we can make better adjustments for the exoskeleton and um, you know, keep a user safer, make more efficient motions, make sure that they don't trip, make sure that they avoid an obstacle or denting a car that they're working on. There's a lot of uh, room where these sensors could work. And then there's also contact sensing. We Constantly in exoskeletons are attaching with soft and flexible strapping to the user because bodies are soft and a little flexible. 
And so by using sensing that is embedded into those straps and things like that, we could learn more about the user's intent. So there's a lot of development left to do in exoskeleton space. There's a lot of places where exoskeletons can be used. Um, they are devices that help people overcome physical limitations, um, but there's a lot of research to be done. So I hope that some of you will consider joining us in building the next exoskeleton. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie, for that amazing presentation. Just both of you all just blew me off the water. And now we're going to go into looking at some of the questions. And let me see. OK, that's a good one. Um, so looking, this one's going to you, Janan. So um, looking at your, especially that amazing little movie, it should have been some type of science cartoon movie. But how far away do you see us from integrating that technology in society? Yeah, the, well, in university, uh, what we do by nature is uh, something futuristic, uh, something far away. Um, but elements of what we do can potentially be um, uh, used uh, in our everyday life. Uh, but then it has to be a product that has current market. So for example, uh, for the um, uh, sensors we have developed, uh, uh, we have a variety of different sensors, uh, but uh, then uh, for something for near-term use, uh, it has to be manufacturable and uh, reliable. Uh, so the pressure sensors we developed uh, are uh, is among that kind of meets that requirement. Uh, so we have uh, formed a spin-off company, which um, uh, is developing a uh, continuous um, uh, monitoring, blood pressure monitoring um, uh, tool for uh, babies uh, first, because uh, uh, for adults, it's um, uh, too complicated uh, uh, to predict uh, blood pressure accurately, but for babies, uh, it's already possible. And uh, that utilizes the sense of touch uh, um, uh, based on the sensors that, that we developed. Uh, there, there are other potential uh, applications, uh, maybe for robotics. Uh, uh, that's also something could be more near term. Anything going inside the body is going to be a long time uh, before uh, anything gets approved, especially for new materials so to get inside the body. So that, for that, we're looking at 10 years or even longer. Thank, thank you very much for that answer. Um, okay. Katie, this one is going to you. You kind of like touched on some of uh, the limitations of the exoskeleton. I was wondering if you can go a little bit more into what is the current limitation of the exoskeleton? What can it do, what can't do? Yeah, there's, so in our medical space, for example, our exo NR is very good at being in the rehab space. So we do sitting, standing, weight shift, um, a lot of things that you would see if you go into a rehabilitation center, gym, and things like that. Um, but for a user to take that into their community and start walking around, we're not really capable of doing stairs safely yet. Or um, the example I always like to give is trying to get on a BART car. So you have to get in the right space. You have to step across the gap. You have to get through the door before the door closes. You have to avoid other people. Um, those aren't things that exoskeletons, at least in the medical space, are very good at um, right now. We don't know where that gap is. We um, you know, are relying on a lot of uh, input from the user to make those steps happen and things like that. And so there's still things to overcome um, in, the, in that space. Um, in our industrial space, I think a lot of the work that's being done is in determining exactly what, where these devices are applicable and then adapting them for the specific needs of the, um, of the industry. It's not a one size fits all model. Um, some places need to, you know, apply paint. Some places it's really hot. Some places need to have safety harnesses or something. And so there's a lot of adaptation that has to be done in those spaces. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, let's see. Okay, Janan, another one coming towards your way. Um, 
what is most exciting about the possible uses for your technology in the future? Uh, well, I'm, uh, I want to be able to do something that can help people. Um, so I, for applications, we're mostly looking at uh, biomedical related uh, and uh, uh, implantables that uh, I mentioned that can read electrical signal and uh, neurotransmitter signal in the brain. Uh, and I really would like to use these tools uh, to help us to better understand uh, our brain and, uh, and also better understand the brain gut uh, axis. So the gut is the second brain, um, and that's another place where we can place these uh, soft electronics uh, to better understand it. Okay, thank you very much. Looking like we got time for one more. All right, Katie, um, 50 years from now, right, what do you imagine exoskeleton technology to look like? Um, I I think in 50 years, there'll be a lot more ubiquitous. I think that we will see people using a variety of, you know, wheelchair through exoskeleton type of options, depending upon what their activity level, you know, what they're doing day to day and what their um, desire is. I think that they will be um, functional to a point that uh, people can interact in the community with whatever technology they want. Um, I think that as we see more efficient um, materials and more development in 3D printing and customization, that it's going to be much easier to couple to the body. And as we have more sensing and more input directly from the user's body, then the motions will get smoother and faster and more ingrained with what we uh, want to do. Um, and so that coupling between the user and the device is going to become smoother and smoother. And as we do that, then you're going to see that the trade off for having to wear this additional device is it's, it's an easier trade off to ask people to do that. And you're going to see them, I think, more and more frequently in you know, construction and assembly in people who are just weak. Maybe they haven't had a, a traumatic injury, but they're getting older and they want to stand in line at, you know, for a long time. And so they put on their robot pants rather than bring a stool, you know, something like that. So I think we'll see them in more places as we go. Okay. Thank you very much for that answer. And just thank you both for these amazing presentations. I never knew that we were so close to a world like Iron Man and the MCU, but looking at you both uh, field of study, it's like the future is now, the future is here. So uh, with that, we're going to bring this section to a close. Thank you all who are in attendance, and I will pass it back to Camille. Camille, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Inseki, and thank you, Jainan and Katie. That was really a fascinating presentation, and I didn't anticipate how apt the title of Inside and Out was. You really had captured um, the robotics from both sides of the, the uh, barrier of the body, so uh, we're really pleased to have your contributions here.